When you look at the Veeam availability platform, one of the most innovative functionalities that we've developed over the years is now known as the Data Lab. Now inside the Data Lab overarching capability rests the Virtual Lab. The Virtual Lab is really where all this started. It's the base building block to enable all the capability that the Data Lab provides. Now what is the Virtual Lab? The virtual lab is going to be an isolated, fenced off environment within your production infrastructure. It's kept completely isolated thanks to a Linux based proxy appliance that we fully deploy and manage for you from within the Veeam software. We configure all the networking parameters. We actually configure V switches and VNEX to make sure that everything communicates properly. So we fully manage and own this for you. Now, when you compare this to something like a test dev environment, think of how much time savings and money that this will save you. You don't have to worry about a CapEx initial investment in additional infrastructure. You don't have to worry about additional power, cooling, maintenance, patching, and more importantly, trying to keep that test dev environment as up to date as possible against production so that you know what you're testing is going to be relevant. So that's one use case. So the virtual lab enables several other use cases, such as Sure Backup, Sure Replica, Staged, and Secure Restore. So in this particular video, we're going to explore what is the virtual lab, how you configure this inside the Veeam product, and why this is the fundamental piece to get everything started that the data lab enables for you. Let's have a look at this inside the software. Now that we're in the lab, let's take a quick look at exactly how to deploy a virtual lab so that you can get started with taking advantage of things like Sure Backup, the on-demand sandbox, and other capabilities. The first step is to simply locate the Backup Infrastructure tab and then locate the Sure Backup section, as you see here. Now, one of the things that I always relate this to is this is like a table of contents. This is where you start and this is where you end up. So if you start with building the virtual lab, then you build the application group, then you build a Sure Backup job, and then finally, you run the Sure Backup job. So if you start at the top, the first thing that we have to do is build a virtual lab. Now, lucky for us, there's already one created in this particular lab. So what I'm going to do is walk you through all the settings. So if we look at properties on this particular one and start at the top, you can give it a name and the reason is because you're not limited to just a single virtual lab. You may have use cases where you need one virtual lab on this cluster, another virtual lab on another cluster. You may have a virtual lab at two different sites. So you can add whatever name you like, put it in the description if you want. The next step is you're going to choose the host that the Linux appliance is going to run on. So this is basically going to be the host that we target to actually run the virtual machines on. Now a little bit later when we look at the deployment models, you can actually deploy the virtual lab that span multi-hosts as long as you're running distributed virtual switches. But for this example, this is a, a simple uh, walkthrough of how the virtual lab works. We're not going to cover the distributed method. This is going to be if you run a virtual lab on a single host. So in this case, you would choose the host. You could create a resource pool with a specific name if you want as well as choose what folder all the virtual lab files will live in. The next option that you have here is data store. Now it's important to understand what this is for. When we run Sure Backup, the whole idea of what Sure Backup is doing is running the virtual machine from the backup file. And we actually do this using our instant VM recovery technology, which we have another video on if you're unsure of exactly how instant VM recovery works. But if you need to redirect all the writes while we're running those virtual machines in the virtual lab, you can redirect the write cache back to a production data store to pick up additional IOP performance. Because remember, if you're redirecting writes to production storage, they're going to be much more accessible from an IO standpoint than if you were still reading that back from the deduped and compressed backup file, which generally is going to live on slower repository style disks. So this is just a way to improve performance. And where you might use this is if you planned on using SQL servers for on-demand sandbox testing and patching and scripting and things like this, you may want the best possible performance out of the virtual lab. This is one way to improve that. Now the next step is when you start getting into networking. 
Now the proxy appliance is gonna be enabled by default. Technically you can disable that if you'd like to manage networking on your own, but this is certainly part of the magic of what the virtual lab does for you. You're simply gonna give the virtual appliance proxy a name. You're gonna pick which data store its files will reside on. You also have to connect it to a network. And this is where I see people uh, really get confused. So the idea here is you're picking your production network that the proxy is going to reside on and you have to make sure that you give the proxy an actual routable IP so that you can access this proxy component from your production network. Now if you're running DHCP for everything you could certainly leave everything automatic or you can statically assign a production IP and all the, all the corresponding information such as the mask and gateway and DNS servers so that you can hit that proxy IP on the production network. Now, the next step is if we look at the deployment model. So as you can see here, the middle selection, the advanced single host manual configuration is one that we generally recommend for most deployment scenarios. Now, like I said earlier, you can do advanced multi-host if you're running DVS and you can technically do basic single host and all this is going to do is try to go out and resolve all your networking parameters but I find it's a much better practice to simply manually put those in okay now the next step is you're doing isolated network mapping now this is where it's going to come in if you're running any VLANs you may need to map those networks so if it's just going to be a simple one network is accessible from within the virtual lab you're just going to map the production network to an isolated network. So if we click on the one entry that's here and hit edit, you'll see your options. You can click browse, you can go through your networking tree, locate what you consider to be your production network, select that here, and then you can literally give this one a name. Now this is also a point that could be confusing. Notice how this is a drop down. So a lot of people think, you know, you click this drop down, you're supposed to have a selection here. What you can actually do is to just start typing in a description. So you could literally type in whatever name that you want this isolated network to be called. And then also if it needs to be on a certain VLAN from a communication standpoint, you can make sure that you tag it with the right VLAN ID. Now the reason I've got the Veeam console up on half the screen is to show you here on the left hand side Notice that the actual production network in this isolated network matches the name. So if we hit cancel and we zoom in to what was already there, notice how it says VLAB-ISE and then you get this long string. That's the same thing that you see over here under the network section. Now keep in mind, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, everything that we do inside this virtual lab fully manages it on the hypervisor side. So when you make modifications in this Veeam GUI, you don't have to do anything in vSphere in this example. You don't have to go create any vSwitches. You don't have to create virtual networks, anything along those lines. Everything is fully managed through the Veeam GUI. Now, if we hit next, this is also a point that could be uh, confusing. So this is where you're actually attaching a VNIC to the proxy appliance, virtual network adapter. Now, if it's just a basic network and you just want the one VNIC doing one network translation, then you're just gonna see one entry. Now, here's the problem that I see a lot of people bumping into. What you're trying to do here when you're setting the IP address is you have to set this IP address to your production gateways IP address which seems like something you shouldn't do because it seems like you're setting yourself up for a network IP conflict. But in reality, what this is doing is posing as the default gateway on this isolated network. And you know, if we take a step back and look at what the virtual lab is doing, remember any VM that gets turned on inside this isolated virtual lab will not have a direct connection to production what they will be connected to is this isolated network that we created in the previous step. So for an example, if you've got a production VM that you're running inside this isolated environment and it was statically set from an IP standpoint, it's gonna be looking for dot one in this IP scheme for the production gateway. 
So if you didn't set this on this particular VNIC, so this proxy appliance can pose as the default gateway, you simply won't be able to communicate with that VM, right? No network traffic will be routed because the gateway will be inaccessible. So it's important to remember to always set this IP to match the production gateways IP. Same thing with the mask, it needs to match what is set in production. All right, now below, this is where you're modifying the masquerade. Now the reason we use masqueraded IP addresses is so that proxy appliance can do the translation. So when you do the masqueraded IP scheme, you can enter in whatever you like as long as it is a non-routable IP. You certainly don't want to use any IP range that's routable. This needs to be a non-routable IP address. Now, by default, the Veeam server will have all these routes in the route table, but that's the only machine that will natively know how to access these virtual machines. Okay, now, if you need to enable DHCP on this virtual appliance, you can do this, but I would only recommend turning this on if you weren't in, in, in an environment where everything was statically set. If everything is statically set in your infrastructure, there's no need to run DHCP, so I would leave it turned off. But if you don't have you know, anything static set, this is where you can create that DHCP service. So any of those VMs that get fired up with DHCP will pull an IP from the proxy appliance. Okay, now the next step, also very important. I said just a moment ago that by default, only the route table of the Veeam backup server will know how to access the VMs. So if you want to create static address mapping, so static IPs, this is where you can do this. You can actually check this box and add in a static route that maps over to the masquerade IP, which is called the access IP, for the virtual machine. So where this is useful is, let's say for an example, you want to give a SQL DVA access to instances of their SQL servers running inside the data lab, but you don't want them to have to bounce to the Veeam server, then access their SQL VMs inside the virtual lab. Ideally, it'd be much easier if you could simply give them a routable IP on the production LAN that would actually wind up inside the virtual lab. And that's exactly what you're doing here. So what you're doing is, let's say for an example, 10.0.0.10 .10 is the production IP address of, let's say, your SQL server. Then what you would do is say 10.0.0, let's say 1.10, as long as this is not a routable IP, as long as nobody else is using .110, would then route to its isolated access IP inside the data lab. So what that means is you can now go to the SQL DVA and say, you know, anytime you need to do testing and patching and DevOps or whatever the case is, custom queries and scripting, make sure you don't hit 10.0.0.10 because that's going to be your production SQL server. Hit 10.0.0.1.10 and you're actually going to be accessing that instance that's inside the virtual lab where we can destroy all the changes simply by shutting it down. It's truly a sandbox environment at that point. Now, again, it's optional. You don't have to enable static IPs, but I find these to be very, very useful because you don't have to worry about, you know, modifying any route tables on other machines. You simply set up static IPs here and give whoever needs access a real routable IP that's available that you've set up here on the production land. Okay, so the last step is simply hit ready to apply. We're not gonna do this since it's already deployed, but this is just gonna give you a summary of everything that we've modified that Veeam is now about to go talk to the hypervisor, in this case vSphere, and actually create and configure all these different resources that you've set up in this Veeam GUI. So that's how you get started, guys, with virtual labs. Again, you can have one or many of these and they have a ton of use cases within our platform, whether it's for sure backup, for sure replica, staged restore, secure restore, on-demand sandbox, on-demand sandbox from storage snapshots. There's a ton of use cases, but to get started with any of those, the foundational component that you've got to deploy and make sure it works properly is the virtual lab.
For additional information, make sure to check out veeam.com under learn, and you'll find a lot more details as well as documentation on how to walk through the setup of the virtual lab. Thanks so much for watching the video and enjoy the rest of your day.